So we are in our series called Living on the Edge. Uh, if you haven't been here, uh, the, this, this is all, the premise of this is about the fact that we as Christians are designed and, and the purpose that we have is different than the mainstream of society, that we are called to live on the edge of society, on the fringe of society, not, not to be completely removed from society, but the way we approach life in our ideas, our attitudes, and our actions, that we just approach life differently as followers of Jesus. And uh, I wanna say, if you are here today and you're not a Christian, that that's okay, that this message is for you too, because I believe if you're here and you would say, well, I don't, I don't follow Jesus, I'm still you know, not sure about this whole faith thing, uh, the fact that you're here tells me that you're at least curious. So we praise God for that, you're welcome here for sure, and we're thankful that you are here. Uh, but this is for you as well, because we're, I'm talking about the character of God, who he is, and what his expectations are for those that would follow him. So uh, this is for all of us, so I encourage you to to tune in today, um, the, the, the verse that we use to kind of uh, come up with the, the premise for this series is out of 2 Corinthians where Paul, the Apostle Paul said that as God's chosen people that we are to come out and be separate. We're to be set apart, we're to be sanctified, which means we're gonna live differently than those that don't follow Jesus. And uh, my text for today is actually out of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And I'm gonna ask you to stand with me if you would please as we, uh, we like to do here is we honor God's word together. Uh, if you don't have your Bibles, with you, which I encourage you to bring them or use the one on your phone and your app. It's always good to be able to read along. We will have it on the screen as well for those of you that don't have it or don't want to uh, open up your phones right now. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, uh, reading through the end of the chapter and the first verse of chapter 11. It says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, everyone say, whatever I do. Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I try to please everybody in every way. For I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many so that they may be saved. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Uh, the title of my message, my message today is Living for His Glory. If we're gonna live on the edge, we're gonna be living for His glory and not our own. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we love you today. God, we thank you for this time together. Thank you for your presence in this room. Lord, I ask that you would minister now as only you can do. I pray that you would open our eyes to see you, that you would open our ears to hear you, and you would open our hearts to receive your word today for your glory and for our good. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. God bless you. You can be seated. So let me start by uh, just kind of getting your minds going a little bit this morning. Um, have you ever had anybody in your life that took credit for something you did? <laughs> yeah, we all have. If you've lived any amount of time, somebody's taking credit for something you did. Um, and in fact, I was even thinking about like a you know, school project. You got a school project, they put you in a group maybe with uh, some other students and you do 95% of the work, you work your tail off, get it all done, you get an A on it. And then the rest of your group goes around saying that it was a group effort. <laughs> and that's a little frustrating. Or uh, maybe something at work where you kind of came in and there was a bad situation and you saved the day. You worked late or you did something where you just kind of knew you, you saved everybody's uh, jobs that day or you just made everything a lot better and only to find out later that your manager took all the credit and uh, got a promotion for it or whatever. Um, we've all had stuff like that happen to us where, where somebody has taken credit for something that we have done. And we live in a society today, the mainstream of society is that we want the credit for things that we do, right? And that's not even bad to want you know, if you do something well to want people to notice it, want people to take notice that you have done something well, it's totally fine to want that. It's, it's inherent in all of us to want to have credit for what we do. And if you don't believe that, have a few kids. <laughs> kids will, want, they want the credit when they do something. And they're so devious sometimes, if the other kid's not around, they'll take credit for something they did. Or cast blame for something they themselves did if they could possibly get away with that. I did that quite a few times to my brother growing up, and um, uh, I still haven't apologized to him for it, but that's okay. Uh, actually, it was, turnabout was fair play, because I remember getting a few of those myself where I got the blame too, but that's just something we want, that's something as human beings, we like to get credit. And there's nothing more frustrating than someone else getting credit for what we did. That's an incredibly frustrating thing when that happens in our life. And this, this series that we're doing is all about being outside of the mainstream of culture the mainstream of thinking. The mainstream of thinking is that I want credit for what I do. So there's nothing more on the edge, so to speak, 
than to not live in such a way where we would want the credit for ourselves. But not only that, but to go another step beyond that and to actually live in such a way that we want the credit for the good things in our life to go to someone else. That's not, that's not in our nature, church. That's not our natural lean to say, yeah, you know, I wanna do this, tons of hard work, and just do my best and then let somebody else get all the credit, get all the glory for it. But that's exactly what our God is wanting in our life. We, our God has the audacity to say, I want all the glory from everything in your life. And to understand that, you have to understand what glory is. First of all, glory is described as high renown or honor won by noble achievement. So, you know, we as humans can get some glory. You know, we can get high renown or honor because of our noble achievements in our life. You know, George Washington got glory for helping the Continental Army defeat the British in the Revolutionary War. Um, Tiger Woods gets glory for being, you know, the best or one of the best golfers of all time. Although everybody knows that if you really know anything, you know it was Jack Nicholas. but <laughs> I'm old enough to remember when he played. So uh, we'll say they were 1A and 1B, how about that? Uh, but we can get glory in this life, but our God is expecting that the glory that we get would be returned to him, that he would get it. My, my text verse, uh, my text verse to say that says that whatever we do, everything we do, let it be all for the glory of God. That we would not seek our own good, but to seek God's good in our life. That he would get all the credit for everything in our life. That when we get a, a good degree, we get our master's degree, or we get a great job, or we worked hard to have a good family, that we would not take the credit and that we would actually want God to get the credit for it. That is not in our nature. In fact, that's not even the way a lot of Christians function in their life. They want to get glory, they want to get praise. We, would not, we don't say it out loud because it, we know it sounds sacrilegious, but uh, the, the fruit of our life shows that that's really what we want in our life. First Corinthians uh, chapter six and verse 19 shows us that we're even, our bodies are even meant to give him glory. It says, you are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Even our bodies, everything about us is designed to glorify God. And he says why there? He says it's because you're not your own. God actually bought you. He paid for you by dying on the cross for your sins because without that, we are all on a fast track to being separated from God for eternity. So he says because of that, you've been purchased, glorify God in your body. Jesus, when he told us how to pray in Matthew 6 in the Lord's Prayer, you know, the, the Lord's Prayer ends with, uh, your kingdom, your power, and your glory forever. It's all about his glory in life. Everything is for his glory from beginning to end. So the question is, why is that? Now, I, I know some of us might be so religious that we would think to even ask why we gotta give God all the glory should make God strike me dead right now. But I completely go the opposite way because I think if we're really going to understand, we're really going to be able to live this out in our life, we have to be able to ask the hard questions. God, why can't I have some of the glory? When I do something really good, when I've worked so hard to get my doctorate, why can't I have some of the glory for that? Why can't you just let me have some? I can still thank you and praise you for it, but can I at least have some of it? And he says, no. He says, everything, whatever you do. And I could quote, scripture. when I started looking up scriptures about the glory of God, it's endless. I'd be up here for four hours if I wanted to share all the scriptures that talk about how he is supposed to get all the glory for our life. But why does he want it that way? Well, the one verse that I feel like sums it up really, really well as to why he wants that from us is out of Colossians. This is another letter that the Apostle Paul wrote in the first chapter. Look what it says. It says, for by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. All things, church. There is nothing that was not created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's basically saying, I made it, I made it for me, and I'm the one holding it together, so there's absolutely zero reason that any of us should get any of the glory for it. If you really understand who he is and, and what he is and how he functions and what he has done in my life and in your life, we would know wholeheartedly that he's gonna get all the glory. And one way you know that is because when we get to heaven, there's not gonna be any glory for us. 
There's no glory for us. It is all about Jesus when we get to heaven. And so that's his plan for us on earth too, is that we would live our life in such a way that we are exemplifying him and bringing glory to him in whatever and anything that we do in our life. You may think it's because of your smarts or your hard work that got you where you are today, but the Bible is clear that he's the one holding it all together is what that word says. You know, if God would just take a break and take his hands off for 10 seconds, everything we have would fall apart. Everything we have. It's easy, it's, don't get caught up in this lie of thinking that God just got the world in motion, he got everything started, he spun the earth and got it going, now he's sitting back and just looking at his creation hoping we do the right thing. That's not what he's doing. He is in all of it. He is in every ounce of it, every second of every day. It says very clearly that in him all things hold together. If he took a break, the sun would stop shining immediately because he's the one that's doing it, all of it in our life. It, the Bible even says in Acts, it says, in him we live and move and have our being. Everything about who we are and what we are is in him. That it have our being, that means everything that we are. There's nothing that you are that is not in him. There's nothing about you, nothing that you could ever do or nothing created in you that is about anything except him. You had nothing, we have very, very little to do with anything that's going on when it comes to anything on this earth. It's all about him. And I know some of you may be looking at me thinking, man, that's, that's really super spiritual. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm the one doing a lot of the stuff, the hands-on stuff here. And that's true, we are. But again, everything we do, is we're doing it because he's given us the ability to do it. Without him, we couldn't do anything. And so it all goes back to him. All the glory goes back to him. And he's not asking us to do anything he didn't already do. You know, Jesus gave up the glory of heaven to be with us, to put on flesh, to walk on this earth, to live a life on this earth and die on the cross. The Bible says that he became nothing. He gave up all of that heavenly splendor to come and be with us. So he's not asking us to do anything that he hasn't already done. In fact, in John 17, Jesus is about to go to the cross. He's praying, he's talking to his heavenly father. And look what he says in verse four. He says, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. So Jesus was there before the world began and he was in glory with the Father. The Trinity was in full operation long before the earth. And all that glory and Jesus left it to come down. So he has every right, every authority to be able to tell us, now you live for my glory because of what he did for us. And I can tell you today, he takes it very, very seriously. Very seriously. You know, God does not share his glory with anyone although we like to steal it sometimes. And he's gracious, he's long-suffering, he's full of compassion for us, he, he wants to forgive us, but the fact is that he does not look upon the, his glory lightly. He takes it very, very seriously. And Paul in Romans 1 talks about what, happens, what happened to the, the people that did not give him the glory that he was due. In chapter one, verse 21, look at this passage. He says, although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is forever blessed, amen. This is, a, this is a powerful scripture that tells us what God thinks of Sharon's glory. It says, well, we learned a couple things here. First of all, what we learn is that knowing God, knowledge about God is not enough. This verse says that even though they knew God, they did not glorify him. So the head knowledge does not cut it. Knowing about him does not cut it. Church, this is incredibly important that we understand this. Just knowing who he is, knowing about him, having the knowledge in the head, but it not being a part of a relationship that we have with him, he says very clearly here, it's not enough. It is not enough. It doesn't appease God to know about him. He, Jesus didn't die on the cross so that we could know about him. He died on the cross so that we could know him, so that we could have a relationship with him. And relationship with him is about us being with him and him being in us and us living our life for him. 
So knowledge of him is not enough. Do not get caught in that trap of thinking, ah, you know, I've read my Bible a lot. It doesn't matter how many sermons you've heard, how much you know about your Bible. It doesn't matter. And none of those things matter if it's just in here. And just for your knowledge, we don't approach our relationship with God like we do a college course or a degree in school where we just need the head knowledge to get through it. It's completely different. And he says it's not enough to know him. But then he also goes on to say that by not glorifying him, that we're given over to our lusts and passions. This is the judgment of God on life. Let me tell you something, church. God is still judging people all the time. He judges us all the time. Now, it's not saying, oh, you're losing your salvation if you don't glorify him in every minute of every day. It's not that kind of a judgment. It's not a judgment of salvation. It's a judgment of the presence of God in your life. He's saying here very clearly that because they did not worship him, because they did not glorify him, it says that he gave them up to uncleanness, lusts of their heart, to dishonor their bodies. He gave them up. That's the judgment of God. He's, it says he's, he's removing restraint. He's not helping them anymore to try to live for God and not to live by their own passions and their own lusts. He's given them up to those passions and lusts because they refuse to glorify him as God. And don't think that you or me are any different than that. If we refuse to glorify him, if we're determined, we just wanna be, have our salvation, but we wanna live for our own glory and for our own praise and our own honor and all of those things, don't think that this verse won't apply to you. He is long-suffering and he is patient, but he will eventually, he will give you up to your passions and your lusts. And church, I know you know this too because I know you see it every day. People that say they're Christians that are just living in, in, however they want. And they're convinced that it's okay because it says very clearly here that their hearts become darkened. And when hearts are darkened, there's, they don't wanna receive truth. They don't wanna receive the light because they wanna do their own thing. Now, I don't know about you, maybe you guys are more spiritual than me, but I have passions of my heart that are not from God. I have lusts of my heart that are not from God. And I need his help. I need the help of God to keep me. The, the most horrific thing in the world for me would be to think that God would give, him, give me up to those lusts and to those passions because that is the last thing I wanna do in my life. I need his help. And so I'm a pretty simple person, okay? I'm not some great intellect. I'm pretty simple. When I read the scripture, this seems pretty clear to me, is that if I don't want my own heart, my own passions, my own lusts to have their way in my life, I gotta make sure I'm glorifying God. I gotta live for his purposes and not for my own, okay? And that's a challenge for all of us because Everything inside of us and everything in society, especially the mainstream of society, is telling us, live for yourself. You can live for the ones you love too, but you gotta take care of you. It's a dog eat dog world, survival of the fittest. And so when we do that, then when something good happens, we want the credit for it too. And God says, I will not share my glory with you. We need his help because we cannot do it on our own. We cannot live up to the standards of his glory and of his holiness in our life on our own. And if you're a Christian today and you're hearing this, you already know that. Because you cannot be a Christian until you know that. You cannot be a Christian until you know, Romans 3.23, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You cannot be a Christian until you know that I am a sinner and I am in need of a savior, that I am not good enough. Christianity, living this life of faith, is not about, yeah, you know, I'm a pretty good guy. I'm, I mean, I don't really do anything real horrible. I'm pretty good, I'm pretty confident, things go pretty well for me. I just get saved just, you know, you know, for some extra insurance. Make sure you know, that I get to go to heaven. That's not salvation. That's not even close to salvation. You cannot be saved until you realize I'm not good enough. Until you realize that his holiness and my holiness, there's such a chasm there that you can't, they can't even see each other. That if there was a list of people that are good enough, I wouldn't even be on the list. I wouldn't even be close to the list. I'd be on one way over here. That's the only way you can step into salvation is to know that I'm not good enough, that God's holiness is something I could never attain. The only way to attain it is to be the righteousness of Christ in me, which is about me giving my life to him and receiving the forgiveness of my sins. So if you're a Christian here today, you already know that. You know that you're not gonna measure up. You know that you're gonna need his help. So we need to make sure that we're living for his glory so that he does not cast off restraint in our life. Now, the good news is, 
It is possible to live for his glory. It is possible to have the mind of Christ. It doesn't mean we're perfect. It doesn't mean we never mess up, but it's a change in how we approach life. It's getting out of the mainstream and sometimes even the mainstream of church and getting on the edge and where Jesus is and where he wants us to live, to have his mind, to, have, to believe for him to have his way in our life. I could tell you that I believe it wholeheartedly that we can live in such a way that we want him to get the credit in our life, that we're not upset if God gets glory for something in my life and, none, and I don't get any of it, that we actually would want that. I could tell you the more I grow in my relationship with Jesus, the more I don't want credit and the more I want him to get it. Now, I'm not perfect yet. I'm not fully there. There's still things where I'd like to get some credit. If, if I go to the mall with joy and I have a good attitude, I want some credit. Uh, there's no doubt about it. If I go in there and I don't get a fever, that's all me. But everything else, I want him to get glory. If, 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 if joy tells me that I'm a good husband, I praise God. Because I know it's only because of him. Because we can't do it on our own. If, if my kids do something good, I praise God. I don't pat myself on the back and say, man, I'm a great parent. I'm praising God for it. If one of you comes to me and says, man, I love your preaching or I love this church, I praise God because I know it's all about him. I know it's only because of him that there's anybody in these seats this morning. And I want that in my life. I want to see him glorified more and more. As we grow closer to him, the more we understand that giving him the glory is where it's at because he returns to us the blessings in our life. And I'm gonna get into that in a minute. But there is definitely some blessing that comes from glorifying God. You know, it's interesting, uh, Harry Truman, the old president, he said a quote that I found this week that I thought was so good. He said, it's amazing what you can accomplish if you don't care who gets the credit. And I thought that was so good, but I would, I would tweak it just a little bit, and I would say, it's amazing what you can accomplish if you want God to get the credit. Because God's gonna work with that. He wants us to glorify him. He's looking for those that will glorify him with their life. So there are some benefits to live for his glory. And I wanna give you a couple of them because I think it'll encourage you and give you some, some insight into why it's such an important thing in our life. And the first one is that it gives us purpose. Living for God's glory gives us purpose in life. You know, the great irony in life that throws off society and a lot of Christians is that if you really wanna have purpose, it's about not living for yourself. If you wanna have purpose in life, it's about not living for your own purpose. It's an, it's, an, it's an oxymoron, right? It's a difficult thing for us to even understand some now, sometimes because every one of us wants purpose. Everyone wants purpose to life. There's nothing more defeating in life than feeling like I'm just going through the motions. I'm just getting up, taking a shower, going to work, coming home, eating dinner, watching TV, going to bed, doing it again the next day. There's nothing more empty than that and feeling like you don't really have purpose. And you could feel like you have it for a minute, but you know, it's fickle. When it's our own, it's incredibly fickle. You could feel great one day, you could feel great one week and feel like, this is why I'm alive. And the next week you feel like, I don't know why I'm alive, right? <laughs> because that's how it is when we're living for ourselves, when we're living to fulfill our own purposes in life. Can I suggest to you that the reason oftentimes that we don't really understand our purpose is because we don't really want God's purpose in our life. We want him to bless our purpose. We want him to bless our thoughts, our dreams, our passions, our lusts. We want him to help us with those. We don't really want his purpose to be accomplished in our life because that's kind of scary. We'd rather go to God and say, God, I need you to bless my whatever, rather than saying, God, I'll give you whatever. It's more about wanting him to bless us. And we kind of have this bartering system with God too oftentimes in our life. And that's his mainstream as it gets, church. People that are far from God will pray for God to do stuff for them. That can't be the sum total of our life. It's okay to pray for God to do things for you. That's very biblical, but that can't be the primary focus of our life and our relationship with God. You know, most of you probably know about the, uh, the incident that happened a few weeks ago on the football field, on Thursday Night Football, uh, the Buffalo Bills safety, DeMar Hamlin, collapsed and was dead. Cardiac arrest, he was gone. They did CPR on him for nine minutes. They had to use an AED to shock his heart back. They didn't know what was gonna happen. They canceled the game. It was, a, it was a traumatic situation for, man, the whole country seemed to like just really uh, gravitate to this, you know, because it was just so shocking. And what you saw was like this phenomenon where everybody was saying, pray for DeMar, 
right? And you probably did, I did. Pray for Damar because of that situation. It was just so horrific. And people all over, for, for a minute, society's stance on prayer changed. It went away, didn't it? Pray for Damar. They were praying for Damar on ESPN. And I can tell you, that is not a Christian station. And they were praying for him. And you, heard, you saw it all over the place, pray for Damar. But listen, church, as great as that is, the people that were praying for him, that, that, that that's, that's the total of their prayer life. It's a very limited thing. To just say, God, I just need you to, to heal Damar because we want him to be healed because I saw it on TV, I'm emotionally invested in it, and this is what I want you to do. And that's all fine and good. But the reality is, is for us as Christians, we don't just pray for God to do something we want him to do because what that does is bringing glory to us because it's for me. I'll feel better if you heal him because we don't know him. If it wasn't on TV when that happened, we wouldn't know anything about it. But because we see that and it would make us feel better to know that this would be good, that's the prayer. God, I need you to bless my whatever. Now, I prayed for him too, but let me tell you something. I prayed that God would be glorified in that situation. That's what I was asking God to do. Like, God, I want him to be healed because that's what I, where my heart is drawn and that's totally fine. But ultimately, God, I want you to be glorified. Whatever it takes to glorify your name through this, that's what I want. And that's, it's a little easier too, especially when it's somebody I don't know. When it's somebody close to you, it's a whole different story, right? Because you just want what you want. I don't want to pray for you to be glorified, God. I want to pray for you to do what I need you to do. And then if I decide to when it's done, I'll give you some glory. But we need to come from a place of wanting to give him glory in our life. That's where we find purpose, church. That's where you find the purpose in your life where you're not just going by whatever is coming, the latest thing to come down the river, but we're actually having purpose every day of our life. Again, I'm a simple person. And when I see, when I see what the Bible says about giving God glory, it seems just pretty simple to me. If I really want purpose in my life, I have to live to give him glory. I have to live that everything in my life would exalt him and not me. And the opposite is also true. If I don't want purpose, or if I, if I wanna live for my own money, for my own comfort, for my own relationships, then I'm not gonna have purpose. It's gonna, wa it's gonna waver just like anything else will. But if I really wanna have it, I need to live it in such a way that he is glorified. Isaiah 43, seven says, we are created for his glory. We're created for his glory. That's why we live, our purpose is to glorify him. Can I tell you, if your purpose is about making money and having stuff, it's as empty as it gets. Why do you think so many rich people are completely miserable? I know you might be like many of us that see a rich person that's miserable and think, if I was rich, that wouldn't be me. I'd be having a good time. It's not true because it doesn't bring purpose in your life. That's why so oftentimes wealthy people just need more and more and more because they think, well, if I had a little more, maybe that would be enough. If I had a little more, maybe that would be enough to make me feel the way I wanna feel. But you won't find purpose in that. You know, we had a, a business for 15 years before we uh, came here to the church to be uh, on staff first and then eventually to pastor this church. And our business at times was incredibly lucrative. And I can tell you right here without any, any qualms about it, it was in spite of me, not because of me, <laughs> many times. But God blessed it in ways that there was times that we were, I was looking at our situation and thinking, oh, we're gonna, be wealthy. I, I'm, I'm just being honest with you. I remember thinking that. And I remember having more money in my checking account than I'd ever had. And I remember feeling horrible about it. Not because I had the money, but because it wasn't fulfilling in any way. It's like, okay, I can spend more money now. But what's that going to do? Because it doesn't give us purpose. And you start to think, well, maybe if I have a little bit more, that'll help. And so when it came time to leave that business and come into vocational ministry, it was incredibly easy for me. It was very easy for me because I knew that purpose matters so much more than anything else the world can give me. And I'm thankful for what the Lord did in, the, in that previous season, and he, he blessed us, and when we used the blessings of God to actually help the kingdom of God, it, made, it gave us a lot more purpose, for sure. But there was times where you just get in the flesh and you start thinking of what you could possibly do, and there's just no purpose there. The purpose is about living for his glory and for his honor in our life. All right, secondly is... Living for his glory brings us rest. Man, there's nothing in life that I desire more than purpose and rest. Not the physical kind. Because you know, if you don't have rest for your soul, 
you can sleep for 12 hours and not feel rested. You wake up after 12 hours of sleep and your wheels are immediately turning and there's no rest. I'm talking about rest for your soul. I'm talking about what Jesus said in Matthew 11. He said, come to me. Come to me. All you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. Rest for your soul. How many of you are desperate for rest for your soul? I mean, that is just such a beautiful, beautiful concept that when I think about that, it just, it just makes me feel like that's what I want. That's what I want. You know how to get rest for your soul? You come to Jesus. It says, come to me. And that isn't just him saying, come to me, and so you can stand beside him and kind of watch and observe him. Come to me there means, come to me, live for me. Live completely for me. Your life is not your own anymore. You're living for a different purpose now. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and that's where you're gonna find your rest. Live for me, live for my glory, that's where you'll find rest. And I love it because he goes on to say then that uh, take my yoke upon you. This is interesting because a yoke is something you'd put over an animal to help to control them. So you can hook up to them and use them for plowing or pulling something. And you know, when an animal puts, gets a yoke put on them, their freedom is gone. Their freedom to do whatever they want in their life is gone. Now they are the property of the farmer and the farmer tells them what to do and when to do it and how long to do it. And that animal will plow a field with the farmer and when that crop comes in, everybody's gonna go to that farmer and say, wow, you had a great harvest this year. And the farmer is gonna take all the credit. He's not gonna say, well, you know, it was all that donkey. That's, he's the one that gets all the credit. Let's, you know, let's honor him and glorify him. The farmer's taking the credit. And so Jesus says, Take my yoke upon you. And I love it because he's saying, take the yoke. He doesn't force it on us. He doesn't force us to do things. He, he allows us to choose whether or not we're going to receive that yoke. And now we are the property of Jesus. We are here now for his purpose. Just like the donkey is there for the farmer's purpose, we are here now for the purposes of Jesus. And that is what brings us rest in our life. Too many of us don't experience rest. Even as Christians, we don't experience the rest that God has for us, and it's because of this. It's because we refuse to live it, our life in a way that he is glorified, and we're not. You know, I, I, the, the rest that I, that I think of, it reminded me this week as I was preparing this, uh, when, when our firstborn was born, the first night in the hospital, uh, Joy had to have an emergency C-section, and so it was, a, it was in the evening, and by the time everything settled down, it was pretty late, the doctors were all gone, and uh, she was, the anesthesia wore off and she was in a lot of pain. I mean, excruciating pain. And the medicine they were giving her was not working. It wasn't even touching it. And they said they couldn't give her anything else till the next morning because the doctors were gone for the night. And so we stayed up all night long. Her, her laying there tense and sweating and hurting and just making faces constantly and crying. And I'm sitting there with her and I'm crying and neither one of us slept because it was just such a traumatic experience. It was actually pretty tough and pretty rough. And the next morning when the doctor came in, first thing we'd said was like, hey, this medicine's not doing it. She needs something else. And so they prescribed another medicine, came it in, brought it in. And as soon as it went in her system, I'll never forget it. Because as soon as it went into her system, her whole body went from to this. Just completely laid back in the bed for the first time. Complete and total rest. And you know, it's funny because I asked her, I said, is the pain gone? And she goes, well, it still hurts a little, but I don't even care. <laughs> she got the good stuff, the really good stuff, which is so interesting. It's so great because this, it, it fits so wholeheartedly with what Jesus says when he's like, I'm going to give you rest. And when he gives you rest, church, it doesn't mean there won't be any pain. It doesn't mean the pain's gonna, you're not gonna be numbed, you're not gonna be floating above everything else and just living a perfect life. There's still gonna be pain, but you're gonna be like Joy was, like, I don't even care. Not, not that you won't care, but it's not going to disturb your rest. It's not going to disturb your peace. And the way to get this rest and this peace is not by reading more Bible, it's not by listening to more sermons, it's not by cussing less and listening to more worship music. It is about living for him and for his glory. That's where that rest comes in our life. That only comes from God. Yes, praise God. The biggest thief of comfort, of peace and rest in your life is living for your own glory. And here's the thing. Living like this 
gives us rest because it changes what we value. It changes what's important to you. How many of you know the things that you value, the things that are most important to you are the things that take most of your energy? And none of those really give you rest or peace. The only thing that, that, that we can value that will actually bring rest into our soul is Jesus. To value him more than anything else. And it's tough because we are in an achievement-based society. The society we live in is very much about achievements. What do you, I mean, when you meet somebody, one of the, in the first five minutes of meeting someone, you're gonna ask them, what do you do? What do you do? That's always fun for me when I'm out in public and it's somebody that doesn't know what I do. I tell them, oh, I'm a pastor. And all of a sudden their whole countenance changes and they start talking to all the Christianese they know. And, Where's your church? Oh, it's right over here. Oh, I'm gonna come. Yeah, no, you're not. Uh. <laughs> People are just different around pastors. Like we're these, you know, like we're just floating around. And, uh, but anyway, that's, that has nothing to do with my sermon. Um, but we are in this achievement-based society. That is the mainstream of society. And I think the story of Mary and Martha tells it very, very well in Luke 10, where Jesus goes into Mary and Martha's house. They're sisters. And he goes in and Martha is busy and distracted with all the preparations. Everything she's He's making the best meal ever for Jesus because Jesus is here. So he's gonna make a good meal for him. And Mary's sitting at his feet just listening to him. And you probably know the story. Martha gets upset and she says, Jesus, would you please tell my sister to help me? I'm doing everything here. And I love what he said in, in Luke 10. He says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. Now, if you've heard this story many times, you, you hear it and you think, yep, that's right. Man, Mary had it figured out and Martha was just, you know, being a busybody. But if I'll take my super Christian filter off and just look at it in the raw, I'll think that's really not fair. Jesus could have cut her a break. I mean, she was the one preparing his food. What, was he gonna, what were they gonna eat? Get a pack of crackers or something? Like Martha's the one really setting the stage for Jesus to be comfortable in their home. And yet Mary's just sitting there being lazy, sitting at his feet. And he gives Martha the hard time. But I, as I studied this this week, you know, it came to me, I thought, you know what? Martha was wanting the glory. That's why she went to Jesus. She was wanting to be, she was wanting him to recognize what she did and say, you're right, Martha. You are such a good hard worker. Man, you're so blessed. God bless you. Mary, get up and help her, All right? When Martha was really just wanting glory. She was wanting Jesus to recognize what she did and give her credit for it. Now. It's not, the, it's not the worst thing in the world to, to do that or want that, but it goes to motive. And how often do we do that? We, we become achievement-based. We are, Martha is much more prevalent in our society than Mary ever dreamed of being. We all struggle with being a Martha, right? Where we just wanna do things, and, and we, but we want the glory for Jesus, look what I'm doing. You know, we may not say, Jesus, look what I'm doing. Make sure my brother does what he's supposed to do. We'll say, Jesus, look what I'm doing. Look how much I'm doing for you. Now I need you to fix my job. Look what I'm doing for you. I need you to give me some money. Look what I'm doing, I need you to fix this. I need you to do this, and we barter with him. You know, we make this arrangement, this agreement with God because, because we are so determined to get glory in our life. If we're really about his glory, then we just say, God, whatever you want. It doesn't mean we don't ask for things, but our ultimate goal is that he would be glorified in the midst of it. Martha didn't want him to be glorified. She wanted herself to be glorified with how much she was doing for him. And that's exactly what was going on in that situation. All right, third and finally, living for his glory brings fruit in our life. And I'll go through this one quickly. When we live to glorify God, it'll bring fruit in our lives. John 15, eight, it says, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. This is so good because the Father is glorified when we bear fruit. So it's like this whole thing, there's, if we live to glorify God, we bear fruit, and then he's glorified from it. Because it'll show others that we are his disciples. It'll show people that we are disciples of Jesus. So it's in his best interest to also help us to bear fruit in our life that comes from glorifying him. Specifically, the fruit of obedience is what I think of with this. If I'm living to glorify him, it, is, it, is, it compels me to obedience much more than any other thing. Because if I wanna glorify him, of course it's gonna require my obedience. And his spirit in me leads me to that obedience. You see, too often times we try to impress God 
to compel him to do something for us, that our obedience is based on trying to show him what we're doing. God, I've, my church attendance has been great. I really need something from you. God, I've been giving in the offering more than I did in the past or more than I can afford. God, I really need you to, to take care of this for us. And, and, and we, we do this barter system with God that we don't necessarily do out loud, but it's what's in our heart. And our obedience is not designed for us to get from God. Our obedience is meant to just glorify him. It is the glory of God being exemplified in our life. That's what our obedience even is. If we're doing it the way that it's been, uh, that he calls us to do it. And I don't know about you, but I hate this mainstream mindset that I deal with too oftentimes is, what's the least amount of obedience I can do and still get blessings from you, God? What's the least amount I can do and still make sure that you're happy with me? Which is such horrible thinking because our obedience isn't what makes God do things for us. Our obedience is not a, 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 it's not a give and take for us where I'm gonna do this so God does this. God blesses us, he does things in our life as he chooses. Our obedience should have nothing to do with what he's gonna do for us. Our obedience is about glorifying him in our life. Romans gives us some insight. In Romans 14, verse seven, I'll close with this verse. It says, for none of us lives to himself alone and none of us dies to himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Our obedience is for him and for his glory alone. Praise God. Would you stand with me, please? I do wanna pray for us today. And church, I know we're not all there, where not every one of us is at this place where, yes, I just want God to be glorified in my life, because Glorify, letting your life glorify him comes with a price because it means there's some things in you that have to die. There's passions in your heart that are not of him. And it's not even necessarily these horrible, sinful passions. It might just be things that you're motivated to do that God might say that has to die or the lusts of our heart that have to die if we're really gonna live to glorify him. It's not easy. And it's easy to say it on a Sunday morning and say, yeah, okay, I wanna do that. But the reality, the reality is gonna slap you in the face as soon as you walk out in this parking lot. So if you're not there, it's still okay to pray and say, God, get me there. Get me to that place where I want your glory in my life more than I want my own. God, please get me there. Give me the revelation. Show me what, I, what it takes for me to really want to see your glory displayed in my life. That it would really be about you and not about me anymore. And that when it is about me, that you would be quick to convict me and show me so that I can turn away from that because that's what happens. None of us have it fully figured out, but it should be something we are begging God to give us, that we would live for his glory because so much of the fruit of our life that we long for, the rest, the power, the obedience, the faithfulness in our life, the purpose in our life springs from living to glorify him. It, it matters that much, church. It matters that much. That's why we sing all the time, you are worthy. A lot of our worship songs have that phrase in it, that you are worthy. We're telling our spirit, even if we don't believe it, we're telling him, you are worthy of it all, God. And hoping that it gets in here to where we really believe it and live in such a way that he really is worthy of it all. I've sang that song before and lied through my teeth while I was singing it. But I've sang it before and meant every word of it too. Let's not stop singing it, let's keep declaring it that he is worthy of our lives. He is worthy of our family. He's worthy of our job. He's worthy of our money. He's worthy of everything that we are. He is so glorious and so great. Everything in your life is held together by him. Tell him, ask him to give you eyes to see it, that he's doing it. Let's pray. You can come to the altar if you want. You can respond at your seat. I just, just tune out all the distractions right now, church, just for these next minutes, a couple minutes. Tune it all out so we can just focus in on him. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for who you are. God, you are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of our worship. You are worthy of our lives, Lord God. We thank you today. You are worthy of it all. Lord, let our lives be like incense rising to you. Let our lives display the splendor and the glory of who you are. And God, for those of us that are not there yet, Father, would you bring us to that place where we can see you for who you are and that we can really truly believe that everything, whatever we do, is all for your glory. 
God, bring us to that place where we know it's true, where we believe it in our heart so that we can live it out in our life. And God, for those of us that do know it, and we, we live to give you glory, but God, where we've made mistakes, where we have taken the credit, where we have looked for our own glory, we've looked for our own renown, God, would you forgive us? Lord, we turn from that today. We repent of it and we receive your forgiveness today. And God, we ask you would help us to that more and more in our life that there would be fewer and fewer things that we would even want to take the credit for so that you could be glorified, God. We want you to be glorified because we know that's how your kingdom is going to come on this earth. When people see our lives, that our lives are to glorify you, it will bring your kingdom to this earth in a greater way. And God, we want to be vessels for your kingdom to come to this earth. So God, would you do it in us? Bring us to the place, Lord, where we have been sure, where we have been selfish, where we've been about our own lives. God, show us that it really is about you. You deserve it all. You are worthy of our worship. You are worthy of our lives. Lord, we take your yoke and we put it on us today. We receive your yoke. We are yours. We are here for your purpose and for your glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen, amen. Let's praise God one more time. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Listen, I encourage you to take this last week of the 21 days and just, just go to God and ask him, pray, ask him to, to reveal his glory to you so that you will live for his glory.